Welcome to the Ask Weldon Show, episode 112. Today is my last day in Berlin. I'm going to try to get two shows out so that uh, you guys don't kind of miss out on the Ask Weldon Show when I'm traveling. And if you want to keep up to date, remember that these shows come out several days later, sometimes a couple days after I film them. Sometimes I get them up the same day, but not often. So if you want to keep up with exactly what's happening timeline-wise with where I'm traveling and what I'm doing, then you should definitely follow me on Snapchat because this is uh, this is where I do my daily vlog, basically. I, I considered recording everything and putting it on YouTube, but I'm just too busy to like do the editing for that and to, to shoot the shots. And so instead, I'm just vlogging on, on Snapchat. You know, you can check the story out. I, I'm going to try to do it on Instagram too, but Snapchat is, is right now what, what's easiest for me. So maybe it's less easy, it's just more fun. I don't know. Anyway, make sure that you check that out. Go to my Snapchat, follow it, Mind Games Weldon. That's for the daily vlogs. That's for knowing what it is that I'm doing when I'm doing it. But this show is all about your questions, so let's dive in. Okay, the first question is from Weldon Notice Me. Isn't this like the second time I've noticed you? Come on, dude. Or dudette. Are there any colleges I should try to get into if I want to get noticed and drafted into the low competitive scene? No, the college you need to get into is the challenger scene college. That would be, you know, the top 200 ranked. That is where you get noticed. You don't get noticed at universities. You get noticed on the ladder, on the global ranked ladder. It's a completely objective evaluation of, like, how well you can impact the game around you and climb. So... What I recommend is you put all of your focus on getting to top ranked in the ladder. And in your position, of course, you don't want to do it in, in like a tertiary position and then, and then you're not playing you know, the right role when you, when you end up on top of the ladder. But yeah, don't worry about the college. Worry about the college that will help you get to the top of the ladder the best. That's usually the most competitive one that you can train with, that you can learn the most in from the people around you, and then they'll help you climb. Next question is from Dylan Schreib, and they ask, how does someone come back from a bad sports season? How do you gain mental strength? The way you come back from a bad sports season is through your support network and goal setting. Most of the time, what you need is recharge. So you need to you need to focus on the three pillars of your support network. I'll give an example here of Peter Doublelift from TSM. Come, wants to come back from a bad season. Actually, it was a super good season, one of the best of his entire career. But then we didn't reach you know where we wanted to attain. So he's building his support network, right? He's going to build that foundational pillar of the cheerleader, the person who is always with you. Maybe he's reaching out for mentorship. Maybe he's getting more journey partners, whatever. The fact is, like, when you put in work on your support network, when you take your brother out to dinner every single week regularly, when you email that person, you know, and update them on what's going on in your life regularly so that when you call them, they have advice for you. That is work, takes extra effort, and, it, and it's a support network. And then they help you transition from season to season to season and see the linear progression of your life or the exponential progression of your life in, in the long run. So that's how you recover from a bad sports season. How do you build mental toughness or mental strength? The answer is very similar to training a muscle. Uh, and, and so I like to use this analogy, even though it's really nothing biomechanically or biologically anything like building a muscle. The fact of the matter is it's... It's like building a muscle. You you have the edge of what you can do mentally, like your mental toughness, which is weird because technically with a muscle, if you can't lift a weight, you really can't lift a weight. But with your mental toughness, if you can't do something, usually if somebody held a gun to your head, you'd be able to do it. So it's like you're actually strong enough. You're just not strong enough to do it without motivation. Mental strength is really kind of like operating in the void of motivation. Most people, you can think of motivation as like maybe steroids, like a cheating. And mental strength is the ability to do the task without the motivation. You simply get up to what you can do without motivation. And then you work on not your discipline. You work on your wiring up of the, the kind of like the task to what you really care about. So you know you want to do it, but you're not motivated to do it. Otherwise, you would be doing it. And, and so you, you take that task and you wire it up to your long-term goals, like what is it way in the future that you want? And you break it down to those steps and then you, you force yourself to do it and you pay attention to what it feels like to be like, uh, and go through the drudgery. And your ability to tolerate that is your mental strength. Your ability to subvert your temporary emotions for your long-term values that is your mental strength. And you simply get better at that by 
doing it. And the nice thing is, it's not like curls where you just get your biceps stronger. When you're doing mental strength training, you're essentially doing this universal strength that you can apply to anything in life the exact same way that you apply it to sport, sport seasons, or, or whatever it is that you're getting mentally strong about, which is why you see people in these high performance careers in sport, for example, who go on to have very successful careers in other fields because they were building mental strength, which is more or less transferable if you do it right. Next question is from Ho Hokotate Freight. Hoko Hokotate Freight. Hok Hokotate Right. What is this first word? Is it like chocolate spelled wrong? Chocolate? I feel like there's like some sort of hidden message here. Chocolate freight. I'm not sure. Anyway, what are some strategies for solo queue bands? Okay, good question, dude. I like this. My strategies for solo queue bands are usually I try to ban the exact same thing every single game so I never have to think about it so I can focus on what's important, which is communicating with your team. So there's literally, literally zero way that you can prepare real bands in a solo queue match because real bands are related to what your opponent's strengths are, what composition you're aiming to draft for, what that composition's weak points are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And on top of that, you can't really ban counter picks because there are enough counter picks that, the, and the champion you're playing is probably enough out of meta that, that it just it doesn't function very well. So I have two strategies when I, when I ban in solo queue. I ban any OP that is OP, so that I know my team doesn't want to play it, and it will tilt my team if the opposing team gets it. So you ban those first. You don't want your team to be tilted, number one. So I always ban the same thing every game. I just try to ban the three most OP champions that I know will get tilted if... My team will get tilted if they get fed. And then if I have extra bans, I ban something that's very annoying for me to lane against with my top pick. So for example, I play a lot of Talon, so I ban champions that are in the meta right now that are annoying to play against. And, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in lane. I also tend to ban the support because I like to just kill the AD carry over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And if they pick a support that can save the AD carry over and over and over again, then I can't assassinate them. So I ban anti-assassin supports. Your bans are 100% selfish in solo queue, 100% selfish. You want to ban absolutely first any OP that's up that might tilt your team if it gets fed. And I know you, you need more bands for that, but just pick the most OP one that you can think of. Just go look at the win rate calculators on some of the, one of the big websites, champions.gg or whatever, and, and look at the win rates and, and ban the most OP ones. And, or the most frustrating ones to play against would be a better, better way to look at that. And then if those are all banned, then you ban the biggest counter to your champion on the map, not in lane. Because they can pick whatever in lane and like get a gank and then be way ahead of you and it sucks, okay? Ban the biggest counter to your champion on the map so that you can at least get through lane and then make a difference if you ban. Usually it's like a support or a jungler, to be perfectly honest. There's a lot of supports and junglers that really screw with certain picks from top lane, mid lane. Jungle, and carry, not so important. But anyway, yeah, that's my suggestion. Good luck. Okay, the next question is from Hundid. Hundid. Hundid it with double D. Assuming that's not a bra size. Could be. Regarding zoning out, going on autopilot, how do you identify when it is happening and stop? This is what it's all about. This is everything. This is the question. This is the number one question. When you're autopiloting and zoning out, how do you become aware of it? The answer is <laughs> that you train the skill to become aware of when you're zoning out. So you have to pay attention to what not being zoned out feels like. Which means usually for me, what it worked like for me was... I trained what it felt like to be clued in. And I tried to extend that to more and more of my life. And then I noticed when I was zoned out, when I was on autopilot. It was a lot easier to notice the, the lack of intense all-in focus than it was to ever train myself to be aware of, oh, because to be perfectly honest, you're probably zoned out 99% of your life. Not zoned out. You're running away with your thoughts. Most of us live in our heads all day long and never in the moment. That's why it feels so good to be in the zone in a video game or something like that. That's why it feels so fantastic because our whole lives are spent just like running around in thoughts and clouds in our head and not here in reality. I promise you that if you spend three months to six months just like grounding yourself in the present, you will just be astounded with, with how much of our life is spent wandering around up here 
in, in like irreality ir- land in our thoughts and how much of our experiential reality is lost on our brain, on our attention, not our brain, on our attention. And so you simply go through three, six, eight months, a year, two years, five years, whatever of, for me, it was, it was only like uh, six months or nine weeks, essentially, but spread out over, over six months because I had some weeks off there where I was super lazy, of pretty dedicated mind, mindfulness training before it really started to click with me on a day-to-day basis when I was zoned out, when I was unpresent. And that's the only answer that I have for you. I don't, there's probably other ways, but for me, like that's what did it, that's what worked, and, and that's what, uh, what I'd recommend. The best place on the internet for that is probably Tara Brock's website because all of her mindfulness scripts are completely free. There's also apps that do that. Tara Brock, T-A-R-A, B-R-A-C-H. Just search in Google. The second bed place, best place, if you like me, is probably my program, mindgamesgg slash Mac, M-A-C. It's mindfulness scripts wrapped with uh, lectures wrapped around them, lectures on acceptance and commitment. So the two steps, after you become aware that you're zoned out and autopiloting, then what? That's the next step, okay? Acceptance, commitment. And then there's Headspace, which is a, which is a phone app one of the best ones. It's the one that I use. It's a subscription, I think $70 a year or something. So my program's a lot cheaper, 25 bucks forever. At least right now. By the time you watch this video, it might, be, it might cost more. And all of these programs are, are, are temporary. Like you just have to get the skill set, right? You just gotta learn the skill and then you can apply it on yourself in your own life once, once you do. Question number four. One, two, three, four. Question number five. Well done, Zo. I love this name. You're awesome, dude. Or dudette. Dude, by the way, I use for chicks, too. So um, I'm just going to keep that from now on as a non-gendered phrase. Mindfulness helps increase my discipline, but I still procrastinate on boring tasks. Do you have any tips? Don't do boring tasks. Is the task important? Don't. If the answer is no, don't do it. Problem solved. Okay. Is the, is, now, if your answer to that is, but I have to do this, then the task is important. Why is it important? Is it important because it's a schoolwork task? Okay, so so don't do it. If the answer is still, but I have to do it, why is it important? Is it important because you want to impress your teacher? Is it important because you want a good grade? Is it important because you want to you want to honor your parents and and you want to do well by them for the for the effort that they put in raising you and and like putting you in school and that's what they trust you with? Is it because you're a role model for your brother and sister who are younger than you? Why is it important? Tell yourself, tell me right now in the camera, tell yourself, most importantly, that is where you have to wire up that action to, okay? So don't fool yourself. I'm telling you, stop doing it. If the task is boring, stop doing it. And if you tell me, but I have to, that means it's important to you for some reason, for something you value, you want to do it, okay? Something in society is telling you that this is important. If you really can't quit it, then you got to know why you're doing it, all right? So... The reason is because of X, Y, Z. All right, so take that X, Y, Z reason. How important is that to you emotionally? How is it important that you honor your parents? Like, that is what you're doing when you're doing that task. So take that reason. That is the raison d'art. What is the French phrase? Raison d'art. I don't even, I don't know how to speak French. But anyway, you know, the reason of being or the reason that it is. Wire that into that little mundane little task you're doing, whatever like 30 problem math quiz or whatever that you have to fill out. Everything that powers you through every single one of those questions is your ultimate reason for doing it. The motion you put towards that, you bring it into the present and that is where you get the trigger and the emotion and the drive to do the next question, okay? You have to have a reason. If, if you don't, if it's boring and it's not important, then don't do it. And if you really are telling me, no, but I have to do it, then there has to be a reason. Just keep digging until you find that core essential truth. And if the reason is because I'm just going through the motions and I don't really know why I'm doing it, then I'm sorry, I have no answer for you. You're just going through the motions and like being a slave to the world for, for no reason, apparently. Break free. Okay, last question. By the way, I want to start taking questions on Instagram, like video questions. If you guys send me a video question on Instagram, like in a chat to to me, can I download it to my camera roll? Let me see. Let me see how that works. Okay, I'm in. I'm in Instagram. Okay, I'm in my messages. Uh, uh, No, that's my video. Save. I think. Okay, uh, shoot. 
Let me let me tell somebody to send me a message and then I'll answer this. Send me a video message testing something. I want to take video messages. I don't know if it's through Instagram or Snapchat, but I want the video here so that it can be something besides my voice asking these questions because like the Twitter, the Twitter video, well, I guess Twitter video works, yeah. You can send it, you can tweet hashtag ask well with a Twitter video and ask a question. That, if you do a video question for my show, I guarantee your question will be on the show. I get a lot of questions now, more than I can answer on the show. If you do a Twitter video question, I guarantee that I will, I'll put it on the show this, this, this week. Not this guarantee isn't forever. This is just for Nat right now. Okay, I don't have anything back from Snapchat yet or from Instagram yet. So let me go on to the next question and I'll answer this after the show is over. One second, I gotta find the. Doo, 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 doo. Last question from Fuzzled. <laughs> Fuzzled. I realize now that probably sounded bad when I pronounced it, but it was an X. Like <laughs> flux. Oh damn it! This guy trolled me. That totally looked like flux. You know but without the L. And I was like, oh, it's not a bad word. It's a, with an X. It's not, oh, man. Fuzz sled. Come on, dude. That's so rude. All right. My question is, have you heard of the heart math quick coherence technique? And if you have, how much would it affect gameplay? All right, get ready for a long science diatribe. Short science diatribe. Okay, heart math is a company that makes a heart rate variability tracker. Uh, heart rate variability is a very powerful biofeedback mechanism that you should be tracking that tells us a lot about how your brain is acting because it is your tracking your heart rate variability, which is determined by your autonomous, autonomic and your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Therefore, they came up with this technique where like, oh, you, you try to manipulate your heart rate variability using your mindset, okay? And then you measure it with the heart rate variability thing. So I use heart rate variability tracker. I use the MFIT QS with all with the pro team that I worked with with TSM, I will use it with the next team that I work with, and it, it tracks your heart rate variability at night. It tells me whether or not you are getting rest or not. That is that is an essential. That is the first thing you should be doing if you're using heart rate variability. Their thing now. Let me explain how this works. They're testing a a symptom of a mental state such as heart rate variability, and then they're trying to essentially mechanically induce a change in that through a correlated activity, an activity that is farther down the causal chain, okay? So the real answer to your question is we don't know, and neither do they, that this has any effect on anything as far as improvement. But it does have an effect on your heart rate variability, and that's what they're arguing. So they're saying, if you do this, and you can reduce your heart rate variability, or increase your heart rate variability, actually, because that's what you want to do, you want to increase it, then that's good, okay? We don't know if that's good or not. We don't know what's happening. We don't know the mechanisms along the chain. Okay, because it's too complex. There's too many. It's it's not direct. It's not a direct link. It's not like we reached into your heart and we lower, we raised your heart rate variability, and then we saw whether. And we also don't know if just raising your heart rate variability by itself induces the effect, or if it's the it's the fact that of how your brain is wired when you have high heart rate variability, or if it's the actual heart that just gets the rest. Or so there's all these chains within this causal mechanism that we know that people who have higher heart rate variability are are healthier and we know that people who have lower heart rate variability are more stressed the systemic wide but what if you fake induce heart like high heart rate variability or low heart rate variability then what happens or what if you real induce it but it's not from a natural event like sleep or meals which we know actually increase heart rate variability just naturally okay so then but does it have the same effect as somebody who's sleeping does it have the same effect as somebody who's meditating meditation essentially the quick coherence technique is like a is like a bastardized version of meditation. It's just like a simple version of, of focus on the present moment, which has the same effect, and, and we argue for meditation for the same reasons, in that it, re- it increases heart rate variability. It reduces systemic stress on your body. So the answer is that the effect on performance is not measurable in the short term. Okay, this is an effect that is holistic about your life and the way that you live it, and it's your long-term bet. It's the way that you apply yourself over time. It's like your exponential curve, okay? So no, you're not going to see a one, the 1% performance increase in your ranking. You're going to see it unless you stretch it out over 365 days. Then you're going to see this exponential growth in your performance. But you can't know that because you won't know what it would have looked like if you hadn't been doing it every single day 
for the whole year, right? So yes, you should think about something like quick coherence, but you should level it up and you should just straight up do mindfulness. Don't worry about some like half-baked solution like quick coherence thing, which is essentially just like the same as centering, a centering activity, which you can learn in mindfulness. I mean, whatever works for you, dude, like if that works for you, great. It would be better to spend your time on something that's more researched. So the quick coherence technique is a product developed by a single company, whereas mindfulness is this widely researched field since 1995 that's been investigated scientifically. And has been around, you know, in Buddhist philosophy for thousands of years. It's pretty refined, a lot more refined than Wave's technique they invented a year ago that they think has an effect on stuff, maybe. You might notice my disdain for that. But anyway, I, I think whatever they're doing, it, it has a good intention behind it, and they're trying to not scare you away with meditation. They don't want to say, this is a mini meditation centering exercise. They want to say it's like a quick coherence technique. Okay, whatever. It's just relabeled the same thing, like rebranded. And then for their monitor, which, by the way, is not very accurate, in my opinion. The most accurate heart rate variability monitor in the world is probably First Beats because it mounts directly to both sides of the chest with sensors that are literally you have to stick on your body like the same kind you use in surgery, right? Well, okay, probably the most accurate ones the ones in the hospital where they like stick it on your chest in like five different pads and they have on your back too. But this is probably the most practical one for athletes. And then probably the, the most accurate and least intrusive one is the MFIT QS, which r resides underneath your bed and doesn't attach to you at all. And they've used it in many different commercial settings, such as hospital beds and things like that. So it's, it's well proven to be accurate up to a certain level required for those institutions. But now it's commercially available for your own sleep. Those are the two only two products that I recommend for heart rate variability tracking because I have not used anything else. Not because nothing else is good, because I haven't used anything else, but I have seen the M-Wave. I haven't used it. I've seen the M-Wave. And I don't think that anything that you get through your earlobe can be as accurate as either the, the other two products that I was talking about. But if you have one, then use it. Oh my gosh, you know, totally use it. That's awesome. Essentially, they're just shining light through your earlobe and I think measuring your pulse uh, and, and the variability of the pressure, systolic and diastolic pressure, maybe. I don't, I don't know exactly how it works, but I, I think M-Wave is the one, the one you're talking about from HeartMath is the one that attaches to your earlobe and then shines light through it to see it. So, yeah. That's my answer, and I hope that is helpful. Okay, guys, let's see if I have a message. One second. What's it say? No message. Oh, man, I got let down. Okay, anyway, <clears throat> I will figure it out by next time. We're going to start doing this, like, seriously. I'm going to start switching this show over to videos. I, I don't want to take text questions anymore. I'm, I'm done, so. I want video questions. I don't know if it's going to be through Instagram or Snapchat or Twitter or just like email them to me, but it's going to be something. And and I recommend that as soon as like I'm, I'm starting to start to do Facebook Live more and more. You notice I did it the other night. You can check those out. Follow my Facebook page, but more importantly, I'm going to start doing Instagram Live. You need to follow my Instagram, okay, because that's where this is most likely going to happen. They're doing a really good job with the video. I really like them. I really like the video on them. You can do longer videos than Snapchat. So you need to follow me on Instagram because I'm going to go live on Instagram. Make sure you follow me and you click the little thing and do notifications when I go live and when I make a post so that you know when I'm asking for questions for the show and when I'm asking for you to follow me on live video because that's where it's going to happen. That's where I'm going to do my live broadcast. And I'll, and I'll broadcast a show here when I'm actually recording it on Instagram Live. I'm going to do it on Facebook Live for the next show. And thanks for tuning in, guys. I will see you next time.